know John Newton wrote that hymn. But the writer also said that toward the end of his life, with his final days here on earth, dementia set in and he forgot so many things and it troubled him and it became somewhat of a burden to him. But out of everything that he forgot, that was one thing or two things that he always remembered. And that was he was a great sinner, but God was a great savior. And I was thinking about the hymn and that fourth verse, which we don't hear too often. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Open your Bible with me. There are two scriptures that we are going to use as a platform for our discussion this morning. The first is found in Deuteronomy 29, 29. In the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 29, 29. And I think, yes, yeah, it's up on the screen. So may we all stand as we give homage to God and his word. Just that one verse, Deuteronomy 29, 29. For some of you, it may be familiar. But this has been a verse that I have tucked in my mind and my spirit for over 40 years. Let us read that one verse together. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. And then go over to the New Testament to Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Seven, I think we want seven. Yeah, six, seven, and eight. Let's go, Nick, let's go back up to verse four, because we need verse four in order to give a continuity of thinking to this message. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Now come down to verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, Will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the utmost part of the earth. Amen. You may be seated. Verse 4, he says to the disciples, I want you to go and stay in Jerusalem and then wait. If, uh, well, some people don't like, how can I say, marking up their Bibles, but to me, I love writing in my Bible when the Holy Spirit gives me a thought. So for those of you who do not 
have any qualms about writing in your Bible, underline there are two key words here. Stay, when he said, verse 4, stay in Jerusalem and then wait. Stay and wait. Those are the two words that our thought will hang on. Stay and wait. After Jesus' resurrection, it was 40 days before we get to his ascension going up to heaven, back to his father. And Luke is the writer of the second volume. He writes his gospel, then he continues this history in the book of Acts. And the book of Acts, some have turned it as being the acts or the actions of Jesus or the actions of the Holy Spirit. But it really doesn't matter what, uh, what theme you give to it. But in the entire book of Acts, we see God's command issuing out and becoming reality in the whole book. Chapter 1, he tells them, wait, stay in one particular place until something happens. When this happens, then you will become my witnesses at home, Jerusalem. Then it will spread to Samaria, your neighbor. Then it will go to Judea and then everywhere. And as we know today, the gospel is going to places that, let's just say, individuals had never heard about the plan of salvation. Now it's interesting here in this text that the disciples who for the last time will physically see Jesus because if you go down to that next verse he said verse 9 after this he was taken up before their eyes and a cloud hid him from their view they asked a question before he told them to stay in Jerusalem or forgive me, after he told them to stay in Jerusalem. And the question was this. Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, what they are asking Jesus was strange because it was diametrically opposite of what Jesus was talking about when he said, the kingdom of God. Their concept of kingdom was different from Jesus' concept of the kingdom. Jesus was talking about a spiritual power. He was talking about using individuals to witness, to talk about him and where the word was spread. Note here the people that asked him this, this question, what nationality were they? There were Jews, the disciples, and others that had been following. And they said, Lord, are you going to bring the kingdom to Israel? There are three things that possibility they might have been implying. First of all, from a ethnic standpoint they could have been implying we want the kingdom to be restored to us as Jews the Jewish nation now if the Romans want to come in we'll let them in but they will have to abide by our rules and regulations now, you have to remember, when they made this statement, who was the governing nation that had control over the whole world? That was the Roman Empire. So they were 
being controlled, they were under the heels of Roman oppression. So they wanted Jesus, what? To flip the script so that they would become what? The prevailing, controlling power and that the Romans would be under their heels. So they wanted a Jewish kingdom. Not only did they want a Jewish kingdom, but they wanted it to be geographical. In other words, we wanted to stay right here in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is going to be the center of this kingdom. And then they wanted it to be a kingdom of power. They remembered the glory days of David and Solomon. You, you, you know, all of us, and sometimes I, I think we do it unconsciously, when we make the statement, you remember the good old days, the glory days. And that's what the disciples were saying, Lord, we sure do want that time when everybody was united, David sat on the throne, he was mighty and powerful, and then Solomon came along and made our nation a great, honorable nation where all peoples respected us and they were afraid to attack us because you fought for us and you gave us victory after victory when they came into the land of Canaan. That's what we want. We want to get back to the good old days of power and glory. We want it to be a Jewish nation. We want it to center here in Jerusalem. Lord, will you restore again, which is implying we had it before, but we lost it. They lost it when the Babylonians came in, carried them captive from the Babylonians to the Persians, from the Persians to the Greeks, now from the Greeks to the Romans. Will you, what, bring back the glory days? Amen? Now, there are two observations and four thoughts that I want to share with us. Write this down. Two observations, only two, that's enough for us to digest this morning, right? And four thoughts. Observation number one, I term it as being an observation of anxious and nervous waiting. Now, I want to bring this text and I want to make the application to us, our church. Is that all right? Now, I know it ain't going to sit well, but I'm not concerned about that. I'm concerned about it in terms of what God wants to tell us. Some of our church family, some of us have become anxious, jittery. We don't want to wait on God to tell us. We want to go back in the sanctuary now. Amen? You know you do. You know you does. Sitting there as if to say, no, we don't want that you lie. Because you're always asking when. Lord, when are we going to be restored? Isn't that question asked of God all the time? Just ask in a different way. But it's the same question. The inference is still there. Pastor, deacons, trustees, when are we going back to the restored and renovated sanctuary? Amen? Dates have been set, but we didn't meet the deadlines. And you know why? Because God 
is in the plan. Things happen that we don't know about. And what God does, he allows us to go through some things to teach us one valuable lesson is in my hands. The battle is whose? And it ain't whose? Thank you. Now let's look at some practicalities here. What if, this is speculate, speculating now, what if? What if after the ceiling fell last year, we did not have this room to worship in? Think with me, like, like the old preacher says, think with me if you please. And we had to leave Brother Collins the building. And we had to negotiate with another church. Let's say West Side. I don't know. Or, or um, down on Washington. Um, what's the name of the church? Central. Central. And let's just say we came to an agreement with one of those churches that we could rent a little space and have a worship service in that sanctuary. Now, we would have to so coordinate it that if they had an early service, our service would have to come after theirs, right? Or if they had a late service, we would have to put our service before their service. Because we go on into what? Their house. Possibly the weekly activities would have to be abandoned temporarily for now. Evangelism on Monday, Bible study on Wednesday, choir rehearsal on Thursday. Why? Because that church has its own activities during the week. So it would what? It would clash. There would be conflict. So we would have to what? Leave off much that we have been doing and then pay them for the little time and space that we were utilizing, right? Or let's just say that we could not negotiate with the church, but we had to go maybe to a Holiday Inn or somewhere and rent a space. And then you would be in worse shape because you definitely could not have any activities during the week. You would only have one service a week. And that would be on Sunday, and then possibly they would say, now we'll give you two or three hours, and after that, you have to be out. If not, we will charge you more money when you go past the three hours. Now, you're talking about murmuring and grump, and, gr and uh, oh, we would really be murmuring then. Amen? But God did not allow that to happen. Now, I know you're saying the seating up here is uncomfortable and it's not like over there. That's the way life is. Life ain't supposed to give you pleasure every day of your life. God ain't supposed to cater to your whims and fancies. He does what's best for all of us. And most of the time that goes contrary to the plans that we make. Man proposes, but God disposes if it's not in keeping with his will. Observation number one. Observation number two, maybe we can use this title. Maybe some want to use, well, want to have bragging rights. Bragging rights. Now, what do I mean by that? We go over in the sanctuary and it's finished. It's beautiful. And the first service over there is packed out. Negroes come in from the north, the south, the east, the west. We heard about this, so we want to see. You know how human nature is. We're curious, nosy. And then after the service is over with, we go out back and, honey child, you know we really got a beautiful sanctuary. In fact, I think, I think our sanctuary looks better than so-and-so's sanctuary. Bragging rights. See, I'm old enough to know us. I've never pastored them, but I've been with us a long time. 
So those two observations could be, might have been, but they're not. For God has given us another place. All we got to do is just walk over here and sit down. The chairs may not be comfortable like the pews, but maybe that's good. Because when you were sitting on the pews, you went to sleep. So the chairs uncomfortable keep you awake. Jesus told the, told the disciples, stay and wait. We want to not stay but get ahead of God. And when you do it, it's a recipe automatically for disaster. We'll get over there when God wants us to get over there. I ain't in no big hurry. I ain't in no big hurry. Because there's some things that God has revealed to us here that was not apparent over there. Over there, we get comfortable. Over there, it, uh, figuratively speaking, that's Canaan. You have arrived. You settle down. You're comfortable. We pray that it doesn't take place. But our foreparents, Adam and Eve, have transmitted to us an infectious disease. And that disease is called capital S-I-N. And the only way that we can get rid of the bugs. It has to be through some blood. Okay. Enough with that. Because I all already see some faces and people's, uh, their, their mouths are getting tight. Posture. Did I come to heal this? I ain't got time to heal this. Yeah, that's what the Lord wanted you to hear. You may not accept it. Now, what are the four thoughts? We said there were two key words, right? Stay. Wait. Stay where? Jerusalem. And wait. What, 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 what are we waiting for? We're waiting on somebody. Who is that somebody? The Holy Spirit. Let me say this before I give you the four thoughts. I would much rather for our church to be a holy, sanctified church than a pretty church. I can't speak for you. Pretty churches don't do nothing but become fixtures. But if we want to do God's will, we got to let God do his will, his way in us and through us. He has a plan. We got to let him execute that plan. The first thought in this text is don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. See, God's got all time. But we ain't got a lot of time. Man that is born a woman is what? And are those days beautiful and lovely and pleasant and enjoyable? No. Full of trouble. What does this song say? And I, I can't remember the tune now. I've had some good days. Had some but when I look at them and weigh it on the scale of eternity, <laughs> God has been good. I could complain, but I know that complaining doesn't change the landscape. Instead of complaining, thank him. And you know, we've been using the term from last year, think and thank. 
If I think low enough, like Psalm 103 says, and all that he has done for me, then I start to thanking him. Now, there are times that you and me, we don't feel like thanking God. I don't feel, I ain't in the mood. I don't have the emotional inclination but God is not concerned about if I feel like it, if I ain't in the mood to do it. He says, does it anyway? And if you keep on saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, then pretty soon the mood starts again and what? better and better. And if you say it long enough, you forget about the negative and you start to what? Dwelling in the positive. And don't think, and I'm going to the next thought, but don't think that in terms of your life where you are now, that you were so brilliant till you maneuvered yourself into where you are now. And you made yourself what you are. If you think that, you are fooling yourself. Because I'm saying this the way old folks say, honey child, God can flip the switch quicker than you can bat your eyes. You can, I, I was talking to a member two days ago. Anyway, we were talking about in terms of how you don't have to be sick to die. You can go in a doctor's office and he can pronounce you as healthy as a bull and walk out on the sidewalk and drop dead if God so chooses that. He can stop the heart because he made it. He can stop the lungs from pumping air because he made the lungs. It has nothing to do with us, but like Psalm 103 says that it's because he has separated my sins from me as far as the, what? the east is from the west, so that those sins don't come back, what? To nag me, to haunt me, to, uh, to, uh, to put like a drag on me, and to pull me down. Don't waste your time with petty mess in your life. Don't waste your time with little folk in your life. Folk ain't going nowhere, ain't got no vision, ain't talking about nothing. Don't waste your time because you ain't got a lot of time. Time is short for all of us. And, uh, and, 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 and the situation is we don't know how short it is. God doesn't send a messenger, an angel, to tell us that, or to tell me that tonight at 11.35 and a half that I will die and he's going to carry me to glory. He doesn't notify me about death. He just says what? Trust me, I will be with you until the end. I will go with you through the valley and the shadow of death. That's all he says, have faith in me because I've already defeated sin and death. Now you trust him or you don't trust him. Don't waste your time. I could go on and say some other things but let's continue. Figure the time. Figure the time. Don't waste your time but figure the time. Jesus said to the disciples, he said, it's none of your business <laughs> for you to know the time or the season. The time is a portion of period, like maybe out, out of an era, out of a decade, out of half a century. Uh, seasons implies opportunity when I can do this. All of us have botched opportunities in the past. The Holy Spirit nudged us. In fact, the Holy Spirit jabbed us. Just like Paul said that when uh, God wanted to get him and he got him on the Damascus Road and he said to Paul, why are you kicking against the prick? You know when God is pricking you, don't you? But sometimes it goes against what my plans were. 
but God don't care. Every one of us has a Damascus road in life. And I don't care where you are like the prodigal son, God is going to get you. Gotcha. He's like the hound of heaven. He will track you down. He knows where you're at. He knows where you try to hide. Like David said, I think in the 139th Psalm, he said, even darkness can't hide me from him. For darkness to God is as light as day. Figure your time. Use the opportunity of your life wisely. Because it may be the last time you have the opportunity to do something in serving God and witnessing to someone before the end abruptly comes. I was sharing with the brethren in the, um, in the office earlier for our consecration. And I was telling him, uh, I think it was Thursday last week, and uh, I'm always the errand boy for my wife, going to the store to get stuff what she needs. She does the hardest part. She does the cooking. So she sent me to save a lot. Save a lot has some sales in the paper. So she said, this is what I want. I want a watermelon. I want this. I want that. And I said, okay, write it down. I can't remember all that stuff. I'm like John Newton. I'm going into dementia now. So write it down. Thank God I still got eyesight I can see. Sister Arden. Anyway, when I walked in Save a Lot, I saw this big old, uh, I call it vat, and all these watermelons in here, in there, then another big old vat. It was rattle, what we call rattlesnake watermelons over here, came from Arkansas, then the regular green watermelons over here. I don't know how to pick watermelons. I remember my father used to know how to pick them, you know, how they would thump them, pump, pump. And I thumb a watermelon, and I don't hear nothing but bump, bump. I don't know whether it's ripe on the inside. I can't tell what on the outside, you know, if it's ready to eat. So there was a black security guard that was standing there like they have in all the stores. So I went to him, I said, sir, blah, blah, blah. I said, can you pick watermelons? He said, oh, yeah. He said, I can pick a good one for you. I said, well, what, 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 what about these watermelons right here? Are they ripe? He said, no, don't buy them. He said, watermelons don't become ripe until the month of August. That's when you start to pick watermelons. He said, these watermelons look good, but they are not sweet on the inside. And now my wife had already told me she wanted a watermelon. <laughs> and the man said they ain't sweet. Now, what decision do I make? So, <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> I go ahead and get the watermelon even if it don't taste good. It ain't my, it's not my fault. But anyway, while we're standing there talking, a person walks past me. I'm not paying any attention. I hear my name called Reverend Bonner. Uh, where, where's that coming from? Reverend Bonner, and I looked at this young lady standing here with her son. I said, yeah. She said, uh, you don't know me, do you? I said, you sure is right. I don't know you. I'm a member of Pleasant Green. I said, when? <laughs> See, I'm, I'm getting old man. I, 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 I hate playing games with folk. When I was younger, I would play that cat and mouth, but no, I ain't got time for that. When? Oh, it, it, it's only been about a year. I said, you lying. <laughs> oh, yeah, you lying. So I had my cell phone, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I took my cell phone. I said, uh, Sister Price, I said, I got somebody here who claims they're a member of Pleasant Green. And I said, go to the computer and see if she's on roll. And she said, what's her name? I told her uh, her name. And she said, mm, yeah, she's here. And she said, I told you I'm a member. I said, well, how long has it been since you've been there? She said, oh, it hasn't been that long. I said, Mrs. Price, she said it ain't been long. She said it's been four years. I said, here, let her tell you how long it's been. She ain't got time for stupidity. And uh, she said, well, okay, okay, it's been. I said, I know it. I said, now, you want to claim you're part of the family. 
but yet when the family needs you, you ain't there. I said, now, I'm sure you were raised that families that pray together stay together. Families get stronger when there's unity. I said, now, you've been gone, and I said, I ain't concerned about why, but I said, don't you think you ought to come back to the family? Well, yeah, I'll do it. I said, no, not when you're going to do it, but it needs to be done now. Because you may not make it then. And you don't impose in terms of I know I will then. James talks, I think it's in the James, that talks about, don't talk about in terms of I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. James said, if God wills it so. But just like, yes, I'm going to do this. Just like you got your life in your hands. And you can't even stop a disease from eating your body. Figure your time. Use it for the glory of God. Does that make sense? Waste, don't waste your time. Figure your time. But live your time wisely. Live it lovingly. Live it graciously. Live it beautifully. Live it with sweetness in your soul. Not lemon juice, or as the old statement says, if lemon juice is there, then put some sugar in it and make some lemonade. Is that all right? All of us are tempted, all of us are challenged, all of us are addressed by Satan. There's nobody here in this room that Satan is afraid not to attack. And if he can, he'll rattle your cage or else he will destroy your life if you let him. Because the book of Job is a theme that addresses that. Why does God allow bad things to happen to good folk and that bad folk seem to prosper? And they do things wrong. They hurt other folk. And yet, look like everything they touch turns to gold. Is there an answer for this, Rum Davis? And Habakkuk asks the same question, but Habakkuk, God gives Habakkuk, he gives them the answer to it. He said, don't look at the beginning, but just wait. Oh, Lord. Wait. Because God has got something in store. And in the long run, the wicked don't prosper. You look at them now, they seem to be faring pretty good. But just wait. Wait. Don't be anxious. Don't be skittish. Just wait. Pray and ask God to calm your spirit. And then, finally, don't waste your time. Figure your time. Live out your time until Jesus comes in his time. Man has been trying to give dates by prophesying. Have you heard these foolish folk? Jesus coming back, I think it was in the 80s. In the 90s, he's coming back. Beginning of 2000, he's coming back. You know what? It's a good thing that God doesn't get his hand on wrath and just smack all of us down. Because <laughs> that's what I would do if I was God. Jesus made the statement, I don't even know the time of the seasons. That's in my father's hand. That's his decision. But that ain't important. That's not for you to embrace. What you are to embrace, you are to what? Go and stay and wait because something is going to happen to you that's going to empower you, give, give you courage, is going to give you power in order to save the story. 
how often we get upset over trivial things that's none of our business. Like Jesus said, we, we strain at a gnat and swallow what? You see the contradiction there? The, the illogical action that's going on. And really, it's a paradox. And what Jesus was, the reason why he used it, because it's so ridiculous till it's laughable, isn't it? Ha, ha, ha. Swallow a little mad. We need to lay hold of eternal things. I end with this. Because God is trying to prepare us for greater things. It has been said over and over again by me and by others. When God's decision is that we go into the beautiful sanctuary over there, we don't want to carry the garbage over there that we brought from there over here. We need to discard the garbage. Attitudes, thinking. We should go over there like if that's a new edifice, we should be new people, renewed, revived, refreshed. Amen? Amen? And the only way that that can be accomplished is, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, you have to be renewed by what? The renewing, the rethinking, the readjustment of what? your mind stay and wait wait for power for the Holy Spirit we have to stop doing things in our own puny strength for it will fail every time it might according to vision it might look good but if it's not of God, like in the book of Acts, there was a gentleman when, when, the, remember when the apostles were arrested and they wanted to kill him after they had flogged him. Right. And there was a Jewish, a Jewish teacher said, just leave him alone. If God is in it, you can't stop it. If God ain't in it, you don't need to stop it. It will stop itself. And I've seen that happen over and over and over again. We want power. How many of you all want power in your life? I'm not talking about influence, prestige, honor. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about spiritual power, Holy Ghost power. How many of you all want that? Do you know how you get it? You know how you get it? You stay and you wait. But in their waiting, they were not doing nothing in the waiting. Waiting, what Jesus was talking about, waiting doesn't mean. Ah. <laughs> no, no, waiting doesn't mean that. Waiting means that in the process of being immobile, but yet you are engaging in something while you are waiting. You're praying, singing, encouraging, teaching, Preaching, yeah. fellowshipping, yeah. loving. You're doing all of this while you're waiting. 
and you don't need to go any other place. There is no other holy place but where God is. He told that woman in the fourth chapter of John, where she was talking about this mountain, this is where we worship, y'all worship over there. Our worship place is better than y'all worship place. And Jesus said, Madam, you are incorrect. It's not where you worship. Help me, Lord. It ain't here and it ain't there. Place means nothing to God. But it's the nature, it's your attitude, how you worship. You must worship him what? In spirit? Wouldn't it, and I'm lodging this because Holy Spirit just giving this to, to me. Preachers, choir, trustees, deacons, urchers, sick unit, audio department, all of our church family. Wouldn't it be a grand thing, and I'm just putting this out as speculating on this. Let's just say we'll be going in the new sanctuary September 1, just using that as a target date. Wouldn't it be grand if the week prior to going into that, our whole church went into cottage prayer services that lets me know what you're thinking. Maybe that's our problem. You see what I'm saying? That's our problem. Until we do it God's way. It will not last. Stay. Wait. For the Holy Spirit. What is more important to the body of Christ? A place to worship. Or souls to save. Thank you. I'm glad somebody has that thing right. Souls are more important than the place. Because we could be out there on the corner of page. Sit down on the sidewalk or get some chairs and move out there. In fact, you remember, what was it, about two, three years ago, we were talking about it had been so hot on the inside and our air conditioning had gone off. We were talking about having a service on the parking lot. You all remember that? And there are a lot of folks that say, oh no, oh it's too hot out there. I must be in air condition. Thinking about how comfortable I want to be, souls mean nothing. And we forget that if it wasn't for God's grace, our souls would be lost. And we would go to eternity without him. Souls, souls, say it with me. Souls, say it again. Souls, say it again. Souls, say it again. Souls. That's what God honors. That's what he blesses. Souls, not buildings. I don't want you to be, to misinterpret what I'm saying. Buildings are fine. Nothing wrong with them. But don't get your life locked into a building. For heaven and earth will pass away. Latch on to what? Eternity. Build your hopes on things eternal. And then what? Hold to God's unchanging hand. He makes the way. Amen. He clears the wilderness. He fights the battles. He places us where he wants us to be. He grows us. 
He inspires us. He refreshes us. He renews us. He loves us. He lifts us. He protects us. He guides us. He feeds us. This is the Lord's world. And all of them that dwell therein belong to him. We are his. We are the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with what? Thanksgiving and his courts. Oh! His courts with praise. Be faithful unto the Lord. Bless his holy name. Sister Stokes, I think you, 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 uh, your favorite song is Psalm 34, isn't it? Okay, get to the beginning of that song. What does it say? What does David say? How does he start out? I want to catch you off guard. Sometimes that'll happen when you're called on. It talks about giving thanks unto the Lord. I will bless the Lord. How often? Just on Sunday? Monday? Tuesday? Wednesday? When I feel good? When I don't feel good, I'm lousy. I will bless the Lord, what? At all times. For his praise will always be in my mouth. Everybody stand. Praise him. I won't. I love. I want to praise. I want to praise his whole war. He's my rock. He's my rock, my rock, my sword and shield. He's my will. 